Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. This is Atticus, and before we start our video today, I just wanted to announce our most liked comment contest. If a comment you posted has had the most likes after exactly one week after this video is published, you'll receive a $100 merch store credit or a gift card of your choice. All you have to do to enter the contest is post a comment. The winner's name will be posted and pinned exactly one week from today. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the Old West setting of the high canyons and mountains of Chihuahua, Mexico. There was a Spanish settlement there by the name of Colonia Pacheco. This area comprises three distinct geographic areas. An extinct volcano named Cerro Mahanoro is the highest mountain in the Sierra Madre Occidental Range, which makes up one-third of the area. The rest is plains and desert. The animal life includes white-tailed deer, wolves, bears, and cougars, plus smaller animals like bats, foxes, and raccoons. The native plant life include lechaguila, mesquite, guayayol, and osotillo. The elevation averages around a mile high, which is the same as Denver, Colorado, back in the States. At the time, the state of Chihuahua had 18,279 people and 94,000 square miles, meaning there was only five people per square mile. That leaves plenty of room for big predators to roam, like brown bears. George and Hiram Nagel were brothers, and in the early summer of 1892, they were helping out on one of their family's many ranches. They were Mormon settlers pushed into Mexico after they were chased out of Missouri in the United States. The ranchers had been experiencing a rash of calf and colt predations, and the area was loaded with plenty of culprits. They had estimated a $300 loss so far this spring, and in those days, that amounted to several thousand dollars in today money. On the Saturday before the day in question, Hiram had been out hunting down predators by himself. He came home and told George and the others that he had run into a really big brown bear, also called a grizzly bear. The two brothers decided they would go get that bear on Monday. They headed out to the area on Monday to where the bear was spotted and split up to search for him. They would regularly meet back up and discuss the plentiful sign and tracks in the area. They also found several carcasses of their calves consumed by the bear, with track evidence present. By Wednesday, June 22, 1892, they decided to hunt along the Gavilan River and pull all their cattle from the area to ensure their safety. The brothers split up for a while and found some of their herd and headed them down a small canyon. As they came out onto the side of the hill, Hiram spotted the big brown bear again. He yelled out, Hey, there it is over there on that point. The brothers dismounted their horses and grabbed their rifles. Hiram shot a 44 Winchester lever action rifle and George shot a 45 Marlin. Hiram opened up the shooting and hit the bear in the vitals, followed by a good shot by George. The brothers continued to fire several more shots and were certain they were hitting the bear, but it continued to walk along the bottom of the canyon. The bear headed up the other side of the canyon and George sent one more bullet in his direction. That bullet hit pay dirt and sent the massive bear tumbling back toward the bottom of the canyon, bawling the entire way. George worked the action of his rifle and managed to jam one bullet into the back side of another one. He reached into his pocket and pulled out his pocket knife and began unjamming his rifle. The bear lay motionless on the ground for a few moments, but quickly struggled to his feet and crawled back up the hill about 30 yards to an oak tree, where he collapsed again. Hiram hollered out, That got him! Let's leave our horses and take him on foot! and immediately began to pursue the bear. George had fired all three of his cartridges, was still working on clearing his last jammed cartridge, so he lagged behind by a few minutes. George yelled at Hiram not to follow so close to the bear trail, as the men were now equally placed on opposite sides of the canyon. George yelled at Hiram to approach the bear from directly below him. As George continued to fix his rifle, he could hear th three quick rounds fired off by Hiram. George figured they were a signal of Hiram's arrival to the top of the hill, but when he looked up, he couldn't find his brother. He jumped up on his mule and quickly rode toward his brother's last known location. He got to the top of the hill and yelled for Hiram, but heard nothing in response. George began following the trail of the bear and his brother around a low rise. As he crested the rise, George could see the bear a short distance away, and it had something in its mouth. The bear was growling as he chewed on the bloody thing in its mouth. Then George saw Hiram's blue overalls underneath the bear. He could see the bear chewing and munching on Hiram's right hand very clearly. Upon seeing George, the bear spit out Hiram's hand and began heading up the hill again. 
George jumped off of his mule and began aiming his rifle at the bear. He fired one of his three remaining bullets and dropped the bear again, but the bear stood back up and started to head toward George now. He tripped to the ground and so did the bear. The bear then clamped its jaws onto a thick pine limb and crushed it into splinters and began to climb the hill again with it in his mouth. George fired one more bullet of his two remaining. That bullet dropped the bear. It writhed in pain and anger, but was injured to the point it couldn't walk anymore. George quickly approached to within just a few yards and put the giant bear out of its misery, and Hiram's misery, with a bullet through the skull. Hiram had rolled over and rose to his hands and knees. He was horribly mangled, and his head was completely bloody and misshapen. George now confronted the reality of their predicament. They were 15 miles from their home and had no other people for help. He cried and prayed as he watched Hiram, now on his elbows, pour blood onto the ground from wounds on his head, shoulders, and face. The pool of blood beneath him grew visibly by the second. Hiram begged for water and George ran down to the creek and brought back a hat full of water for him. He used part of the water to wash Hiram's wounds. George then began assessing his brother's injuries. Hiram's scalp was peeled back about four inches starting at his forehead. At first George only noticed the peeled scalp and several large punctures from the bear's teeth. After some examination George could see where the bear had bitten from the back of his brother's head toward the right eye and crushed that portion of the skull in between. That part of his skull was pulled back and fluid from his brother's brain leaked out. Hiram's cheek was gashed from just below his eye to just under his jawbone, and half of his lip was bitten off. On his face, head, and shoulders were 27 injuries. His right hand was horribly chewed and his left hand was bitten through. There was a large bite wound just above Hiram's left knee and a bare paw imprint on his chest from a paw strike. George encouraged Hiram to muster all the faith he could as only God could help him now. As his brother helped him, Hiram described what led to his horrible condition. Hiram explained the bear went over a rise just out of sight and laid down so he couldn't see it. He approached within a few yards before he noticed it and the bear ambushed him. He pulled the trigger of his rifle, but it was a misfire. He continued to point his gun at the bear hoping the powder would kick off as he ran backward. The bear initially struck him with his left paw as his right shoulder was wounded by one of the prior shots. This slap broke Hiram's jaw and knocked him flat to the ground. The bear then clasped his head in its jaws. He raised his hands to protect himself, but the bear completely overwhelmed any attempt at defense he could make. After taking care of his brother for a moment, George looked around and located what must have been the initial attack scene a few yards away. Hiram's hat and gun were found there. George looked over Hiram's rifle and noticed that it was cocked and had all three cartridges in it still. His brother had only thought he was shooting at the bear during its charge and had never actually fired at it. He apparently didn't chamber around and mistakenly simply pulled the trigger without a round in it and thought it had misfired. The young cowboy was tough and rode the mile and a half back to camp on his horse. George made a bed for him and gave him some milk and water to help revive him a bit. He bandaged his brother's wounds with cloths soaked in salt water and continued to clean up his wounds. Hiram fainted a few times from the trauma, blood loss, and pain, but began to recover a bit. He begged his brother not to leave him alone, even if it was to go get help. Either option for the boys was not great. Hiram was in no condition to ride the rough 15-mile trail back home, and leaving him alone to travel that same trail, going and back, might leave him without help in his last moments. Hiram said that he thought he could make the ride home, with the help of God, and his brother would get everything ready at once. George gathered two gallons of water and put his slicker on Hiram as the weather had began to look like rain. The boys prayed together before George helped Hiram into the saddle, supporting him with rolled-up blankets. Hiram actually made the entire trip alive, while leading his own horse the whole way with only his left hand. He required several sips of water and rode through the night to get home by 10 p.m. Together they crossed timber and canyons in their trip, but they made it home. George gathered up the church leaders and family from the Pacheco area, and they took turns changing his bandages and praying for him and with him. They sent for a doctor from a neighboring town. They used every form of treatment to stop the swelling, infection, and bleeding, but eventually could do no more. Hiram fought hard to keep his life, but suddenly opened his left eye wide and looked around the room at its occupants as if to say goodbye, then breathed a few short breaths and died. George marveled to the others present how Hiram didn't complain or groan during or after the attack and somehow made the 15-mile ride home. He was extraordinarily tough. His 19-year-old widow of only six months wept loudly as her 23-year-old husband slipped away from her while in her arms. Hiram passed away on June 24, 1892, two days after the grizzly bear attack, most likely from infection.
After understanding all the details of this case, I'm left wondering, did the bear lay up in ambush waiting for Hiram? Did the young man actually hit the bear as many times as they thought? Was the bear so tough that it actually lived through eight or so rifle shots hitting it? What do you think was Hiram's most costly mistake? Post your comments below and let's talk about it. A special thanks goes out to Patreon supporters Aurora, April Donovan, Ryan Cernicky, Chris Marlar, Wayne Washington, Fluffy Feet, Cheyenne, Greg Schaefer, Gabrielle, and Drone Adventures. Your monthly contribution help us very much. Make sure to check out our most successful products at our merch store so far, as our unisex college hoodies are flying off the shelves with their giant kangaroo pockets, and our dog tank tops are a favorite of our canine partners in crime. If you enjoyed this episode of Scary Bear Attacks, consider liking and subscribing, and clicking on the notifications bell. Sharing our videos to people you care about might keep them safe. As a member of our human community, we hope you stay safe out there, especially in bear country.